Okay, folks, now that you've seen this movie, we're going to go a little bit deeper now. This gives you an overview. And look, if you could follow that entire movie, you would have everything you needed to know about DNA. So there's a ton of stuff in that movie. Um, right now, though, I'm going to go in a little bit more detail here and give you a little bit more background, and we're going to just dig a little bit more deeper. Now, first, this beautiful molecule that I've mentioned to you, this wonder of architectural design inside every living cell in your body. Now remember, there's 400, not 100, but 400 trillion cells inside your body. And so um, the DNA that I'm going to talk to you about lives in each one of them. And I still am blown away by thinking about that. And uh, let me let me kind of show you at least right now what DNA is made of, how it's built. Uh, Daniel, back to the computer. So you've already met the principal dancers. Uh, you met adenine and thymine in that movie. So what is adenine and thymine? Well, they're actually the basic building blocks of DNA, and they're called bases, B-A-S-E-S. -E the two together are known as a base pair. And there are two pairs of bases in that make up all of DNA. Now, these bases are adenine and thymine are bases because they f and they're pairs because they fit together perfectly. Adenine and thymine, you know, kind of a glove and a hand, chemically. Uh, they just fit together perfectly, and that's why they can pair up. There's another base pair known as guanine and cytosine. Guanine is a base. Cytosine is a base. The two together make up the second base pair. And now you've seen the two base pairs that all of DNA is made of. Now, one thing I need to tell you is if cytosine was turned upside down, for example, in this picture, then guanine would not be able to pair with cytosine. They have to be upright, looking at one another in order for them to fit together. And you'll hear me throughout the rest of this presentation, another eight, ten minutes or so, um, talk about these base pairs needing to fit together well. So guanine and cytosine fit together perfectly. That's one base. Adenine and thymine fit together. That's the other base. You can abbreviate adenine by calling it A, the first letter of adenine. You can abbreviate thymine by calling it T. That's one base. So A and T are one base. And guanine we can call G. Cytosine call C. So G and C are the second base in the base pairs of DNA. Now, this is the real organic biochemistry of adenine. Adenine over here, thymine over here. And like I said, they fit together well. This N represents a nitrogen atom. And this nitrogen atom connects perfectly with this nitrogen atom. And this oxygen atom connects perfectly with this nitrogen atom. So that adenine and thymine fit perfectly well together. That's the first base pair. The second base pair, guanine and cytosine, this nitrogen fits with this nitrogen, this nitrogen atom fits with this oxygen, this nitrogen with this oxygen, etc., etc. So G and C, guanine and cytosine, biochemically fit together perfectly. Now the base pairs are not freely floating inside your body, not anchored anywhere. They're actually anchored to this continuously curved molecule on the side here and here as well. These two molecules are like two spiral staircases facing one another. And you can see that guanine is attached to this molecule. Cytosine is attached to this molecule. Adenine, thymine, and so on. When, when guanine 
when these base pairs come together to bond, guanine and cytosine bond together and, guan and here and here, adenine and thymine bond together, so do the uh, spiral staircases or the curved molecules bind together as well and they in fact crisscross, forming the very famous double helix. And you may Google double helix and you'll see DNA all over the place. Wrap, wrap your mind around this. It's pretty hard. All these bases that I've shown you, guanine, cytosine, adenine, thymine, two base pairs, in every cell, and remember how small a cell is, a thousand cells at the end of a period, pretty darn tiny. Believe it or not, there are six billion, that's not million, that's billion bases that live inside just one cell. Now, I find that totally mind-boggling. To give you a perspective of what six billion would mean, if I were to line your class up, or somebody your size, everybody, uh, you know, students, uh, shoulder to shoulder, and line you up, that line would go around the world 47 times. So it's just mind-boggling how much information is stored inside one cell, six billion bases inside one cell. So do you think that computer companies that are trying to create computer programs and computers that are for, say, artificial intelligence, that needs a lot of stuff, a lot of data in a small space, doesn't it make sense to you that computer companies are actually studying the DNA molecule to understand how to make artificial intelligence computers. A perfect example of taking lots of information and putting it into small spaces. So I'm going to ask you a question for a second. If you were the designer of six billion pieces of DNA and you wanted to take that information and store that in one tiny, tiny cell, how would you do that? Just We'll take a minute. Anybody out here want to venture a guess how you might do something like that? Well, don't worry. Can you repeat that? When I Yeah, sure. If you were to take and this is a tough one. This is a tough one. If you were the designer of a small cell and you wanted to put 6 billion pieces of information in that cell, how would you store that in the most efficient manner? How would you place it in there for the most efficient use of the tiny space that you have? I mean, I asked myself that question. That's an architectural conundrum. That's a real question that an architect would have to ask himself or herself. You don't have to have the answer on that, but I want to get you thinking. I just want to get you thinking. Somebody have a hand up? No? Yeah? I just want to get you thinking. And here's how it's done. Does everybody see Everybody see this cord, this black cord in front of me? Consider it a big strand of DNA, okay? Now, the most efficient way to store this is to wrap it around something. And that's just what DNA does. It wraps itself around a piece of protein. Not a piece of protein like a steak on a, on a plate, but a small molecular sized piece of protein. But just the idea of wrapping it around, to me, is a stroke of genius. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the way to do it. To take all that information and put it in a small space, and now I can't get the darn thing off my finger. It's cutting, cutting off my circulation. Ha, ha, ha.